Well, welcome to the first episode uh, of this uh, podcast, or maybe vlog, we could call it, um, which um, is a nonpartisan podcast uh, that deals with uh, politics around the world, uh, looking at political events uh, from a, mostly from a comparative politics and political philosophy perspective, but not neglecting other perspectives and with some uh, emphasis or points of focus on specific themes and regions. Now, this is vague enough, right? Uh, but let me explain what all of this means. So, uh, first of all, um, what does it mean nonpartisan? And, and I emphasize this uh, because it truly describes the nature of this, of this uh, podcast. Uh, it means that the I have, and this, this podcast and our discussions have, uh, and as you will see, have no political affiliation and definitely no affiliation uh, to any party. Um, and so this is something that is very important, both both programmatically, but also uh, personally uh, uh, for me. Uh, so it's nonpartisan. Uh, and I mentioned that it will discuss politics around the world. Uh, politics around the world, mostly as it happens in different countries, uh, societies. Now, society means different things, right? Societies can be at uh, country level, right? They can be regional, they can be uh, so within a country or they can be regional, uh, so encompassing uh, parts of different countries, right? So the politics of the European Union or of Central Europe, that's a region, right? So um, we will look at how politics uh, happens in different uh, places and why. We will try to understand why. And in order to understand why, uh, as I said, the, the perspective that we will use um, it will be mostly that uh, of uh, comparative politics and political uh, philosophy. Uh, and let me explain what that means. Uh, in, in the United States, uh, political science, generally speaking, uh, is done in, um, uh, in, in four ways, in the sense that it has uh, four major uh, sub-disciplines the discipline of political science. And these sub-disciplines would be uh, comparative politics, international relations, political philosophy, and American government. <coughs> and I left American government at, at the end for, for a particular reason. Um, so uh, briefly, what, what does this all mean? Um, so comparative politics is the discipline that studies how politics happens, as I said, in different societies, and implicitly or explicitly compares how politics happens in different places because human nature is the same, right? Um, certain um, uh, political developments, certain phenomena are the same no matter where they happen, they just take different forms, right? Uh, so, for example, in order to have a state, you need to have institutions. Now, the form that those specific, that, uh, that um, the institutions take in different uh, states, right, will be different. Uh, so that's, you see, uh, implicitly or explicitly, it's a, it's a comparative approach. Uh, so you could compare, for example, in comparative politics, politics in Germany versus politics in, in, in France, or the role of the prime minister in Germany versus the role of the president in France. Just an example. Um, and then there is international relations, which is another sub-discipline of the discipline of political science, or of the field of political science. Uh, and this is basically the, the uh, discipline that studies uh, the relationship between uh, international political actors, mostly between states. Um, and then there is political philosophy, which asks, um, generally speaking, the, the basic questions, well, there are many ways of doing it, right? But, but um, the way I like to approach political philosophy is uh, as the discipline that asks the fundamental questions about politics, right? So asks the questions before politics, like what is politics? What is the purpose of politics? What is, the, what is a society? What is the purpose of a society? And so on. Um, and, and then we get to American government, and I left it at the end because it is a separate uh, major subfield of political science uh, in the United States for obvious reasons, right? Because it studies the politics of the United States. But if you look at it, um, you know, from a non-American perspective, it basically should be, right, a subfield of comparative politics because it studies politics within a society. So, so that's kind of how I approach it. Now, I have thought I have taught uh, in all of these subfields. Um, so, I'm going to use tools from all these four subfields. But the the ones with which I am more um, 
um, so to speak, uh, uh, friendly, on friendly relations, uh, or I enjoy using are the tools and perspectives from comparative politics, including American government and uh, political philosophy. So that's, that's kind of the perspectives that this uh, podcast will use. Uh, so a nonpartisan podcast, um, it um, uh, examines politics around the world, as I said, from the perspective mostly of comparative politics and uh, political philosophy. And yes, I do have notes. I always have notes. Um, and, and I mentioned that it might pay attention specifically to certain topics uh, or themes or regions, indeed, because those are my regions of interest hopefully also yours. <clears throat> so such such uh, aspects would be uh, the modern state uh, and its institutions, um, issues of ethnicity, nationhood, nation building, um, nationalism, um, politics in, in plural societies, which is societies that are characterized by um, different the coexistence of different ethnic, religious, cultural groups. So they such societies pose very peculiar questions and have very peculiar richnesses as well as vulnerabilities. Um, the issue of ideology, politics and religion, or religion and politics, politics and culture, uh, broadly understood, politics and sport is an issue that uh, preoccupies me. And in terms of, of um, geographical regions, uh, I have a specific interest in European uh, politics and also in Central and Eastern Europe. But these are non-exclusive themes and non-exclusive regions, as you will see even in today's episode. Uh, basically, we will not really deal with Europe. So the European politics is not going to be really a subject necessarily, um, a subject of focus. So that's about it. Uh, a few words about me. Um, my uh, background um, it combines practical experience, lived experience uh, and practical experience with academic work. Uh, so, um, the, the, for example, the themes that interest me and that this podcast will deal with, uh, they interest me because I have experienced them on my own uh, trajectory, during my own trajectory, during my own life. <clears throat> uh, but I also have been involved in uh, developing international programs that dealt with these things. So uh, I've been involved with, and I keep remain involved with the policy dimension, so to speak, of these issues. So uh, developing and, and creating and implementing programs of international cooperation, democratic development, uh, inter-ethnic and inter-religious dialogue, uh, cooperation between nonprofits from around the world. So I've been doing this and continue to do this in various uh, ways or, or community development. Um, but um, that Practical experience is also um, also feeds into my academic work, um, and I have graduate uh, degrees in various of these disciplines, especially political science, but also religion, um, um, or religious studies, and and um, and also in other fields. Uh, so I have you know um, uh, academic studies in these in these uh, fields. But also I have been teaching political science for, uh, well, 10 to 15 years, depends on how, how we calculate it, uh, at various universities uh, around uh, the United States, uh, various colleges. Uh, so, um, and also I keep writing and, and researching and uh, whenever I publish something, I will also mention it, well, not always, but uh, on, on the podcast, just to reference it. Uh, and in fact, um, so so that's about me. And in fact, I want to well, one more thing to add uh, to add here is that this this uh, video podcast or vlog or whatever whatever we want to call it is a sort of um, an outgrowth of a, of a written uh, blog that I used to uh, keep. Uh, but I just find this um, uh, this tool and this mean these means uh, uh, more. Um, appropriate to what I want to do, so this video format. Uh, but this video format, this podcast, this video podcast will coexist with the written blog in the sense that uh, uh, the, I will always post references or further readings uh, or resources, further resources for the topics uh, that we touch upon on each in each episode in the blog. And the blog will be linked in the description box of this of this video. So if you want to read more about the topics that we cover, you can go to the links in the video. Usually I will not give you links directly here, but I'm going to give you a link to the to the blog to to the blog. Um, and finally, uh, the, um, 
according to plans right now, um, we will have uh, another one new episode every two weeks, um, and uh, mostly on the Mondays. Usually on the Mondays, un unless something happens or there's a you know holiday or something, um, which will be announced. But mostly this is intended to be a bi-weekly podcast. We'll see how it goes. Uh, it we might have sort of intermediate, um, like every other week we, we might have. In the gap uh, Monday, we might have some other things like uh, not so uh, developed, you know, podcast or discussion. Maybe just uh, uh, qu some quick thoughts. We'll see. But for now, uh, we'll start with a bi-weekly uh, podcast. And uh, how about the name? If you will notice in the description, this uh, podcast and the blog from which it originated is called Hicksunt, which is a Latin word. I will not explain that now. Maybe in a future episode, or I will let you think about why it is called Hicksunt. Okay, so that about the the, the intentions and the, the format of this podcast. So let's just jump into the today's uh, topics. Uh, and usually we'll have, you know, a couple of major topics um, in each uh, episode. So today uh, I would like us to, to discuss, to cover uh, the recent and the current, I would say, uh, crisis of the American <coughs> polity, which I argue is also a crisis of liberalism per se, or a manifestation of that. And the second major topic would be um, the Navalny versus Putin uh, conflict, let's put it that way, that takes that is taking place right now in Russia, and obviously I'll explain more if you are not familiar with the with the context there. Uh, so these are the two major topics: so the United States crisis and the crisis in Russia, um, in the Russian Federation. And we will end. And generally, every podcast will have um, at the end, let's say, uh, a, a briefer uh, discussion or reference to, uh, for example, a book or a movie. Um, or, or maybe something interesting or, or, or funny that I found uh, that I want to share with you. Uh, in, in today's episode, we will, uh, I will make a reference to this TV series, uh, Carlos, which is a French TV series or an international co-production co uh, TV um, sort of um, mini-series uh, that, that, that deals with the life of Carlos the Jackal, famous terrorist. Yeah, so that's going to be, we're going to end with that. So, uh, first topic, uh, this crisis of the American polity, right? So, uh, needless to say, right, we, everybody was up in arms about um, uh, what happened at the um, U.S. Capitol building, right? The building that hosts the uh, representative bodies, <coughs> the, the legislature of the United States at the federal level, right? Uh, Congress. And, and everybody was up in arms. Um, and the danger in such cases, and it, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's understandable why people would be um, uh, up in arms, as I said, or, or scared or, or outraged or whatever the reaction would be. But I want us to st take a step back and understand what is going on from a from broader perspective, because the danger is to get lost in the minutia, uh, which you know, if you get lost in the weeds, they don't explain what happens. And, you know, in, 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 the, in this podcast, what we're trying to do is to understand, right? That's the main purpose of this conversation that I'm trying to have here with you, is to understand what is happening with the tools of, uh, with uh, let's say scientific tools of, uh, of the discipline, right? Um, so, so in order to understand, we need to take a step back, I would argue, and go, for example, to 2008, 2009, uh, when we had the, the, the economic crisis and uh, you know, the crash, so to speak. And when we had the rise of the, those two um, uh, movements, simultaneous rise of two movements, which was the Tea Party and the Occupy movement or the Occupy Wall Street, which then became Occupy movement. Um, so I want to, to, us to, to, to step back there because the same thing that happened then, the, the rise of these two movements, which uh, appear to be different things, uh, but were in a, in a way the same thing, also happened this past year in 2020. Um, because in 2008, 2009, both those movements, Occupy uh, and um, uh, Tea Party, were actually populist movements, yeah? populist reactions to that, to that crisis. And uh, my argument is that um, what has been going on in 2020 across uh, along the year, 
yeah you had violence yeah you had street violence you had the attack on public buildings you had the burning of buildings you had violence on the streets and violence against institution the institutions of the uh, of the federal state and uh, of the federal um, government and institutions of the state government uh, they are the same phenomenon in many ways or manifestations of the same phenomenon um, uh, let me uh, and what is that phenomenon and that phenomenon, in my argument, is the, um, is the crisis of liberalism, and I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, but first, uh, let me explain why I said that Occupy and, and uh, Tea Party were the same movement. They were populist uh, movement. And what are populist movements? Um, and it's not by chance that populism has been uh, a phenomenon that uh, has been on the rise since well, in the last 15 to 20 years uh, around the world. You see, that's the comparative perspective. It gives us a, a, a tool to understand what happens in a specific society, let's say ours, uh, and we, not, it doesn't allow us to fall into the mistake of thinking that whatever happens here is unique and extraordinary and it's never happened before and there's no way to understand and we're stuck in this little box of uh, misunderstandings or of not understanding. No, we are not. Yeah, The same thing is going on in other parts as well and learning about uh, this thing happening elsewhere helps us understand uh, how it happens here, why it happens here, and so on. Or hopefully it helps uh, us to understand. Um, so, what are populist movements? Populist movements uh, are not a new thing, right? Um, but uh, what they have in common, they have been around for you know more than a century in modern politics, and probably forever, I mean, surely forever since politics has existed. Populist movements um, are usually, in modern terms, are reactions to major crises, usually economic crises. Um, that uh, economic crises because they cut very deeply. Uh, that are characterized by one thing, and this is what gives them uh, sort of their power and their specific importance. They're very, um, they're very, uh, they're filled with energy. The energy that comes from rage, from outrage. Yeah. So this is why uh, people, especially in that specific context, and political actors need to pay attention to populist movements because they mobilize a lot of people. Yeah. When you um, rage, right, anger. Uh, which responds to a crisis, to a trauma, yeah, that is a very powerful mobilizing tool. So the power, the power of uh, populist movements comes from their uh, ability to mobilize a lot of uh, people, thus resources, uh, thus political potential. Uh, their weakness, however, is that is the counterpart, right? That they are ready to go, but they don't know where to go. <laughs> so there's a lot of energy, but there's no clear direction. Yeah, so that's that's how it happens that in uh, in uh, 2008 2009 you had Tea Party and you had Occupy, which were the same th populist reaction to the crisis and to the mismanagement of the economy by let's say the politi political and economic elites. Let me put it that way: the big banks, the big investment funds, those people there, Wall Street, whatever. Um, and both of them were, you know, Occupy Wall Street. Oc why Wall Street, right? Because it was directed against these 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 actors. Um, so they were the same reaction, only that they were, this reaction was channeled differently. Uh, this reaction, uh, and then it, you know, it was incorporated according to the established institutions of the political system. Because within a political system, there are established uh, actors and institutions like parties, yeah, um, which uh, need to deal with such populist uh, movements um, that are against the status quo. But what these established institutions like parties can give these populist movements is a direction, is a program, is a platform, is a, uh, okay, uh, you're angry, here's why, so an explanation, and here's what we need to do, a plan of action, yeah? And that's what happened also, uh, obviously, in 2008, 2009, these sort of Occupy and Tea Party were hmm, quasi-incorporated in the United States in one of the two parties, because we have a two-party system here, which doesn't have to be two-party system, but that's a different discussion. Nothing is a given in politics. Nothing has to be. Um, but anyway, so that's that's what that's what happened. Um, so, you know, again, let's step always. Let's take a step back and understand why this happens, and not necessarily don't be uh, don't get. Let's not get bogged down in the minutia of specific forms that these things take, because as I said in in my perspective, from my perspective, what um, happened in 2020 on, let's say, call them various 
um, uh, sides of the political spectrum or, for, or, or, or with motivations coming from different uh, angles or points or, or corners of the political spectrum um, were manifestations of the same thing, which I call the crisis of liberalism. So let's, let's, um, let's explain what, what that means. Uh, for, first of all, when I say liberalism, I refer, I'm referring to classical liberalism, right? So classical liberalism, which in many ways is the sort of the bedrock of, of modern politics in the West and also has been exported elsewhere. Uh, and it is rooted in a, uh, in a set of, um, of fundamental ideas. And let's not confuse in American parlance or in American public sphere, there's a confusion between um, uh, liberalism understood as the left, um, which is a, a more recent development of the term, and classical liberalism. I'm referring to classical liberalism. Um, classical liberalism, as I said, is the bedrock of the modern um, sort of uh, pol politics uh, throughout the Western world and just. <clears throat> and the foundational um, uh, pillars of, of liberalism, classical liberalism, are, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, the emphasis on the individual, yeah? uh, the, uh, the emphasis on uh, the equality between individuals in the sense of the equality of value, yeah? not on equality of potentials of, or, or, or powers or, or uh, abilities, because uh, that's nonsense, right? We are not the same. So don't, let's not confuse equality of value, right, which is then becomes a legal equality, yeah? equality under law, yeah, which is not the same with sameness or identity. I notice that there's there's this trend of confusing, you know, um, um, uh, these two terms. Um, uh, some two things being identical and two things being equal. No, human beings are not identical. They're not the same. They are not supposed to be the same. It's an impossibility for them to be the same in any way, shape, or form. Yet we give them equal value yeah so individual equality yeah uh, of individuals under the law so to speak and we're going to talk about why uh, or where this does, this comes comes from um and freedom yeah because liberal yeah uh is you know it comes from latin and and it, it it comes from you know the word freedom yeah um libertas so freedom um, so the freedom of the individual. Um, now, if each individual is um, equal in their potential, uh, equal you know in their value, uh, and each individual is inherently uh, free, uh, how do we have a society, right? So we have many authors, uh, thinkers who have uh, tried to to make this work. John Locke is a very influential one. Um, was a very influential one, and. Um, so the, the conundrum was how to build a society when you have in self-interested individuals, right? Which each of them could do whatever they wanted, right? So another thing evolved as part of liberalism, which is um, the idea of the marketplace. Yeah, the marketplace of ideas, the marketplace of goods, uh, and so on. In the idea being what? That we are different. We, each of us are different. Each of us, each of us are free. Uh, so because we're different, we're going to have different interests, different views, different opinions. So this is an inevitable, inescapable reality. And that's, that's what we need to understand here. That this is a given. There's no way to erase this. So if this is a given, yeah, what you know, Locke re refers to as the state of nature or Hobbes. Um, if this is a given, we, the politics needs to, needs to be set up so that it manages this given reality. Yeah. And how does it manage it is by creating mechanisms like the market in the economy or representative institutions in politics that manage this inherent conflict of interest and ideas and opinions and transforms this into common action. This is why uh, most, well, all in, in, in fact, of the uh, modern democracies are not actual democracies in the original uh, sense of the Greek antiquity, right, which was direct democracy, which was basically the whole citizenry getting together as a, en masse, yeah, the, the populace, and, and deciding on something, that's direct democracy, that's not what we have. We have representative democracies, but it's not the people directly who decide pass laws, yeah, but it's representatives. So it's a filtered, yeah, representation of the different ideas, and this filtered representation of different ideas is, is taken into a closed, so to, so, to, so to speak, box or, of, or, or um, 
game field, yeah, where there are strict rules, uh, established rules that everybody agrees by, and these people who represent these different ideas play with each other according to those rules and clash these different ideas and at the end something is produced which is what which is policy which is common action and this these are the institutions of representative democracy namely specifically the legislature so at the heart of the modern democracy is not the head of the executive which is a non-democratic position in many ways um, because it, one person cannot represent the different ideas, you can't have this, this, this process. The legislature, right, in the United States, the Congress, in other countries, you know, they're called different ways, but basically the legislature uh, it is the place where different representatives of different ideas, of different, you know, uh, elect uh, people, citizenry, meet, and according to rules, clash those ideas and opinions that are in conflict. Because let's understand very clearly, conflict of ideas or, or, or disagreement is inevitable. Once again, is inevitable. Yeah, just ask yourself and ask someone next to you, uh, you know, what's their opinion, what's their favorite ice cream uh, um, uh, flavor? Yeah, you're gonna disagree, right? But we need to buy ice cream. So we're gonna agree on something. I'm gonna buy vanilla today and chocolate a week from now so that everybody's happy or we're gonna buy both or, you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so conflict is inevitable. The only question in a society uh, is where this conflict is played out because it's inevitable. <laughs> Let me repeat it again. It is inevitable and both three, both sides, there are thousand sides and all these thousands of sides think that they're right, of course. Of course you're going to think they're wrong and they're going to think you're wrong. So the solution of this is not to finally, you know, convince them that they're wrong or sh shut them up. Yeah, that's no longer democracy in the liberal paradigm. That's not the way to go because then the whole, you know, human rights, individual rights, individual freedoms are trespassed against, right? The liberal paradigm. Everything that I'm talking about is the liberal understanding, so to speak, uh, paradigm. And you see, it, it's, it sounds like, well, that's normality. No, 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 that's not normality. That is the modern paradigm in many ways. Yeah. And you're so embedded in it that it seems like this is normality. This is the description of normality. No, it is a description of normality. So when we talk about people are individuals and all this, all this. No, this is the, the liberal uh, interpretation of reality of human beings and of society. Let me, let's be very clear, which is a very recent understanding. Just the word individual is a recent invention. The, 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 the concept did not exist until like 200 years ago. Individual, right? Uh, human being was always characterized as a social animal, a social being, not as an individual. But anyway, parenthesis closed. Back to what I'm talking. So we're talking about uh, from the liberal perspective because we need to get to the crisis of liberalism. And um, so, so uh, conflict is inevitable. So it's either played out uh, where it is, yeah, in the population, because that's where conflict exists. Yeah? People have different opinions about what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. Very different opinions. Or <clears throat> everybody agrees to play by the rules and delegate this conflict through the institute, through, through voting, yeah, uh, electing of representatives who then go to this closed box, yeah. Uh, think of it as I said, as a, as a field for a game like football, soccer, whatever, where they fight it out there, yeah. And, and because they, they will fight it out because that's why we send them there. It's always amusing when I, when we, you know, I hear people complaining that, oh, people in Congress or legislature, they always fight. Yes, that's the point of the place so that you don't fight with your neighbor. You send other people to fight there only that they fight without bloody means, yeah, because they, we all agree that there's some rules and, you know, there's majority voting, there's voting, there's majority. So there are rules there by which this conflict is played out so that what? Laws emerge and laws are what? Policy and these laws will determine how we live. And we might not be happy because the, the other side or other sides have the upper hand, but that's not going to stay that way. We need to persuade more people. We're going to have the upper hand next time. So this alternation of of who gets the upper hand or who gets to this, to kind of influence the policy more, although compromise is always necessary, yeah, uh, because this 
diversity of opinions will remain, but this alternation of who gets to have the upper hand is also a normal part because of how the world works, again, according to the liberal paradigm. Okay, so now you see, now you see, and perhaps a little bit more, how what has happened last year, uh, uh, both over the summer and then in the winter, are manifestations of a crisis of liberalism, because all of that conflict, all of that fighting, all of that burning down of buildings, well, which buildings were they attack? Were, were they which institutions were they attacking? They were attacking the institutions, the buildings, the institutions of either federal or state government or local government. Um, they were attacking the police, which is the institution of the local uh, or state government in the United States, mostly, um, uh, and a key institution that imposes the power and maintains the power of that institution. And in the um, uh, in the winter, they were attacking the what? The legislature, the federal legislature, which is again in a key institution of this whole system. And why were they attacking them, right? Because, well, that's, we can go into a larger discussion about that, but again, not in terms of the immediate reasons. Yeah, we're, we're, we're taking a step back. But they were attacking them because they did not believe anymore that the institutions, these fundamental institutions of the liberal democ of liberal democracy, of the liberal democratic political system that we have, that they are of any use anymore. Yeah, defund the police was one of the re uh, uh, slogans. Abolish the police. Uh, you know, I don't know what they were shouting at the Capitol, but basically they were destroying the Capitol. Yeah, the the legislature there, because. It wasn't doing its job according to what we thought was right, namely, you know, Donald Trump should stay president or you should make him president or something like that. Yeah. So you're not doing your job. You're no longer of any use. <coughs> so we're going to take the things in our own hands. The problem is, you see, that if you take the things in your own hands, the other side, you know, when you when you take conflict from this delegated level of the representative institution, and you take it back into the into the into the society on the streets. The other side is not going to just other side. There are a thousand sides, uh, but let's say the other groups are not going to stay and say, "Oh, okay, so you took power in your own hands, yeah?" Because we all agreed to that's the Lockean and Hobbesian view as well that we delegate we get delegate the right to in, to to use violence to these common institutions of this of the state because we elect them, and so not only the state has the power to to use violence uh, through, the, through its institutions like the police or whatever, army and so on. When we take back that, you know, we dis, dis, sort of disenfranchise the, the, the elected institutions, we also take refuse to delegate that power of exercising violence anymore to these common institutions. So we take it back into our own hands. But, you know, Locke Hobbes would say, well, that's the return to the state of nature and the state of nature in both of them is not nice. Even if it's at lock, it's, do, it's manageable uh, up to a point. It's not nice because it's a state of violence and conflict uh, after a certain point in Hobbes from the beginning. Because there, what, what, what happens, you take, you know, okay, I'm gonna take back the stick from your hands and put it in my hands and I'm gonna do some justice. Well, the other guys who don't agree with me, they're gonna say, they're not gonna sit around and say, oh yeah, okay, well, I'm, can I turn the other cheek? No, they're going to pick up the stick as well. Yeah, they're going to pick up the stick as well. What happened? What was the thing that really led to the civil war in the United States in the, in the 19th century? Is when the South withdrew its representatives from Congress. Because then that delegation of, of, the, of, the, of the conflict from the, from the society into the representative institutions, that process of delegating it there and taking care of the conflict there, Ended. And it's not like, okay, if we um, abolish the legislature, conflict disappears. <laughs> They're always fighting. No, no, conflict remains. It's only that comes back to us, which is not a good situation to be. So that being said, why um, I think this is very important to understand, but also important specifically for the American polity. And this is why I said that the crisis of the American polity, by which I mean, I mean society and political system, uh, is um, also the crisis of liberalism. And it's very important, especially in the case of the American polity, meaning society and political system. Uh, and it's good to refer to them together. I'm going to explain why. 
And the reason why it's, it's, it's uh, especially um, dangerous, this crisis of liberalism, I'm not saying it's bad or good that liberalism is in crisis. That's a different discussion, which we might have. But I'm saying, why is it dangerous for the American polity? It's because the entire American polity is built on liberalism, on these ideas of modern liberalism. And if, you're, if you are American or are familiar with the American sort of uh, political culture, you will notice that things that I mentioned, like individual freedom, seems like, okay, you're saying obvious things. No, I'm not. If they, seem if they seem obvious to you, it's because you're steeped, as I said, deeply into the liberal, classical liberal view of the world, which is not necessarily the true truth about the world. It might be, it might not be, that's not my point here. But it's not the only perspective or interpretation of the world. Yeah, And this is why many of the critics of liberalism rightly point out the, the, the um, partiality of the liberal interpretation of the world. But let's, let's get back to what, what I was uh, saying. Um, the United States writes one of the key documents that established it, in, uh, in fact, the document that is sort of claimed to establish the very um, state of the United States, uh, the Declaration of Independence, we all, many of you know it, I'm sure, um, is deeply influenced, yeah, I'm not saying anything new, by uh, the liberal ideas of John Locke. Right. So if you go then, and in fact, Jefferson, one of the main authors of the of the declaration, if you go and, and uh, look it up, <clears throat> you'll notice that he almost quotes from from Locke. I mean, he quotes from Locke with some changes, uh, minor changes. Uh, but the entire philosophy on underlying the United States as a state and also as a society is the liberal philosophy, right? Famously, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by the creator with unalienable rights. That Among these are life, liberty, and here's Jefferson's change, the pursuit of happiness, Locke said property. Uh, and it's because of, to, and it's to secure these rights that governments are established. So exactly as I said, human beings are in a certain way Governments are established to manage the way human beings are so that they can still live in a society in a productive way. <clears throat> uh, but, and here this is very important, because if you read the Declaration of Independence, you will notice that um, the reasons given for um, separating the, the English colonies from their motherland and because were, these are all English colonies, yeah? uh, populated by Englishmen. Yeah, of course, some of them, you know, born here, but they were Englishmen, English citizens, and so on. The reason given uh, for this is uh, the reasons given all emerge from this paradigm, because uh, the entire argument is that the, 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 the British government did not secure these rights. Did not. These, did not. Um, do his job because all governments are supposed to secure these rights, these liberal rights, yeah? And if you don't do it, then you're no, no longer good as a government. Point being what? That the very notion of the existence of the United States is predicated on the liberal paradigm. Individualism, freedom, rights. Yeah? These, these, these specific things. And they say, because you didn't respect them, we're going to form a different polity, a different state. And, understand what he, what the author author's author is saying there he's not saying we're germans and we want to separate from the french because we're germans yeah he's not saying we're french we speak a different language we separate from the russians because they are russians which how do we know because they speak russian they are orthodox we're catholic we're protestant point being what the, the, the criteria, of, in fact, in the document, you will notice that he makes reference to the common language, common culture. So there's no really like, like OK, but we're the same. How, why would we separate since we, we have the same culture and language? It's like, what's the reason? Yeah. The reason is steeped in this liberal paradigm. So the very existence of the United States and the reason why it can be a multi-ethnic state, well, of course, it's a, it's a melting pot. It's not really a multi-ethnic state because the different ethnicities sort of melt into a common sort of, uh, you know, common language, yeah, uh, um, uh, population. But, but <clears throat> even if you speak different languages, um, 
That doesn't matter because what binds you is your commitment to the state, the United States. Uh, you want to become uh, an American, you, you, you take uh, the oath and whatever, whatever. You become an American by becoming a citizen of the state, not by being of a specific ethnicity. Yeah? You cannot, this is not true for most other countries in the world. The, the perfect example for this used to be Germany, uh, where you could live in Germany for generations and could never obtain German citizenship because you were not an ethnic German. So I always use, uh, as I used to uh, always tell uh, my students, um, Germany, the thing with Germany, because it's an ethnoculturally constructed nation and state, which are two different things, uh, is that there is no such thing as, is that it has the potential of being both a good Germany and a bad Germany. Because Germany is simply the, the, the state of the Germans, yeah? And it can be democratic, it can be uh, totalitarian, it can be, you know, Nazi, it can be whatever, it can be an empire, right? It can be, and it has been. <coughs> now, the United States is not like that. It's not the, 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 the country um, of a specific people speaking a specific language, because then what with, what's the, with the Canadians, what with the English, right? It, that's not, it was a contribute around a set of political ideas. And the idea was, well, if you agree to these, yeah, then you stick with us. And this is why there was the War of Independence and there was, a, you know, in a way, a civil war within the colonies because, you know, a third of those people, the same people who, you know, similar with all the rest of the people from the colonies, they said, well, this is nonsense. I'm English. You're English. How, why would it separate from the mother country, even if we were both born here? Yeah. So not everyone agreed because it was like, what? The point being that the entire edifice and identity of the United States as a nation and as a state and as a political system is built on the liberal paradigm. This is why this crisis of liberalism has been brewing for maybe 20 years in a, in a more evident way, um, is of specific uh, of peculiar importance and danger in a way for the United States. And, but is it inevitable? Maybe it is inevitable because, as I said, the liberal paradigm is a recent paradigm. It emerged maybe 200, 250 years ago. This is not the last, first, or ultimate interpretation of reality. It's a specific view of reality that emerges in a specific context. As such, it has a beginning, it has an end. So the impact that, that the decay of the liberal paradigm, which has been happening for a long time, including the United States, will have on the, on the very foundations of this of this state, political system, and nation, so to speak, is a very important and interesting idea. And you're seeing now, and you've been seeing with Trump and with Biden, pendulum swing. None of them in a liberal way, yeah? but in a, to, to an extreme or to, a, to, a, to an angle, corner, that questions or not, does not take liberalism really seriously does not take the idea of compromise seriously. They are ends of pendulum that are, uh, well, they're against compromise. Well, I'm not gonna go further into this, but, but these, are, these, are, these are the interesting sets of, of, of questions that are raised by um, this crisis of liberalism, which is, as I said, what's, what's going on are manifestations of this, but it has been happening for a long time. And why it has been happening, and this is a deeper question, you know, maybe since the eight, <coughs> well, I'm, I can't even point to a beginning. Maybe it has always been in a crisis in a way. But I, th I think that especially since and after the 80s, um, I'm talking about the United States uh, or the Western world, the foundations of liberalism have been severely questioned. And the foundations of liberalism you, you noticed, remember from my quote from Jefferson, um, which is a quote from Locke in many ways, the foundations are, are um, let's call them metaphysical. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What? Says who? That all men are created equal. Created by whom? The reason why I'm asking this question is that this is a, these are questions that many people would ask, 
But notice that none of the things that follow have any solid foundation if you remove this, these, these two sentences. Because the idea of the equality of human beings, again, not identity, not the fact that they're uh, identical, because they're not, is the, the equality is equality of, of worth, of value. And it goes back to the Judeo-Christian framework like it or not, that's not our that's not our purpose here to 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 tell you to like it or not. Uh, but that's the context. This is this, this context of the of the Western civilization or culture um, within which human beings were understood as being in a, in the in the exact same relationship with a power that sort of created, founded, uh, made them. And whether or not you know you believe. You know, it's 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 a you know you're a deist or not, or that's not the question. The point is that unless you agree that there is this metaphysical structure of reality in which each of us is in the same relationship of worth with uh, with the common ground of existence, legal equality doesn't make sense anymore because it becomes arbitrary. Because from this equality under sort of what you know in in the traditional political thought was was called the well natural law. Um, eternal law, whatever. So equality within existence of all human beings under, let's say, a God, yeah? or the same sort of source of existence. Without that, yeah, the legal equality has no basis. And the same, and but and then individual rights and freedoms have no meaning. Now, what has been? And again, I'm not going to make an argument for or against here because this is not. We're trying to understand. Yeah, we're trying to understand phenomena, and it's we can talk about arguments. We can even discuss more uh, things or uh, different aspects in a different occasion. But <clears throat> what is important to understand is that if you, like with everything, if you undermine the foundations of a structure, what do you think will happen to the structure? Right? If if everything is relative and there's no foundational sort of value or, or truth to to any statement then you can't go turn around say that and then you say everything is other there's no truth turn around and say but human rights out of what that's a whim that becomes a whim that becomes a fantasy so so the deeper question and the crisis of liberalism um and the, the deeper questions that it uh, uh, this crisis uh, raises is um what well, can be taken in two different ways one is to point out that if you uh, remove the foundations, don't expect the outcomes, the outgrowths to survive. And that's, been, that's what's been happening in my argument, is my argument in the past 30 years, that we've been coasting on effects of the foundations of liberalism. And again, I'm not saying that liberalism is the truth or the right interpretation of reality. I'm just saying this is the paradigm within which we exist up to this point. But what does the future hold? Point being, yeah, that if you remove the foundations, you can't just coast endlessly on the effects because then the effects will also be questioned. And that's what's going on now. The masses, you know, different parts, yeah, are questioning, questioning the effects, are questioning the very purpose of representative institutions, are questioning the very, pur- the very uh, legitimacy of having different opinions. And But you're wrong. So shut up. Right? Yeah, but the liberals say, yeah, 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 but the other guy was going to say the same thing. And, you know, liberalism emerged in modernity in many ways because of the wars of the religion, one of the major important um, reasons. Uh, the wars of religion, which were, think of them not as wars of religion, but wars of truths or of constitutions. The same thing that happens today, yeah, let's say, because one side says, I have the truth, the other side says, I have the truth. And they're adamant that they have the truth. And of course, you're going to say, but of course the other guys are wrong. And they're going to say, of course you're wrong. The point is, we go back to that, that this conflict is inevitable. Well, enough of this, yeah. Uh, but that that was the the, the, the the point that I wanted to make. And the points I wanted to make was uh, were um, connected with this idea that <clears throat> the crisis of the American party, the crisis, plural crisis, of the American polity um, uh, that's 
the, the most the more virulent uh, manifestations of from last year the explanations or the roots of this for them and the deeper phenomena underlying and generating them sh should not be looked for in within last year and they raise more deeper questions that as i said are specifically important in the case of the american polity okay <clears throat> so that's that's for that's for our uh, first um, uh, first, first, the first part of this of this discussion. So um, let's move on to the to the second part. It's hard this way because I don't, you know, I don't actually have a chance to <coughs> have an interchange with you directly. Maybe we will do streaming in the future. So the second topic that I, uh, the second major to major topic that I wanted us to to discuss today. <clears throat> as I mentioned, is this uh, you know crisis in Russia? If we want to put it briefly and superficially, but is this um, conflict seemingly between um, Navalny and Putin? So who is Alexei Navalny? Because you all know who Putin is. Alexei Navalny is now considered to be the most uh, prominent opposition figure in the Russian Federation. And he used to be a social uh, media figure, uh, anti-corruption blogger. That's how he made his name. Then he kind of moved from the online sphere to the IRL, you know, in real life sphere. Um, <clears throat> has changed also in terms of some of his positions. But what remains is, is his anti-corruption drive and the fact that he's in opposition to the current regime. <clears throat> and the reason why there's this uh, crisis or conflict right now in the news is as you might have seen is that um, well in August he was poisoned with Novichok Novichok which is famous and you know there's little question of who could do it who would have done it because Novichok was the same su substance used um, what a couple of years ago a few years ago in um, Salisbury the UK where another and opponent of the of the uh, current Russian uh, regime Sergei Skripal and his daughter were both poisoned famously right in a, what was it, a tea shop tea, tea house with with Novichok and then they uh, <coughs> there's this famous um, video on YouTube which I'm, I'm not gonna link but you can find it where the two alleged um, uh, poisoners yeah Russians uh, who were seen on cameras is, is walking around Salisbury and whatever and came for a day and left and they were asked why were you doing in Salisbury and famously they explained that they came to see the wonderful cathedral because it's the uh, is the highest in, in, in England or something it's, it's really really funny but anyway um, so Novichok has been used let's call it let's say probably by the <clears throat> some of the services of the current uh, Russian regime I mean all the indications point in that direction uh, we don't have strong, you know, information who exactly and what, but clearly, you know, it's a practice. Yeah. So um, let's not forget the former president of Ukraine who was poisoned and so on. But um, so Navalny was poisoned, but survived. He went to Germany, was treated, came back, uh, what, a couple of weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> and the moment he step, uh, uh, set foot in, uh, in Russia, he was arrested on uh because <laughs> some 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 people said um, in a very kafkaesque move truly he was uh, uh, arrested because he broke the terms of his parole because the parole uh, probably wouldn't have let him to um uh, leave the country or should he should have met with the officer parole officer whatever uh the parole of, uh this is um he was paroled uh, based on a case from a couple of years ago some fraud case but uh which many people say it you know it's one of the ways in which the regime attacks its opponents is that it involves them in, in uh, fraud cases and the courts are usually subservient and pass such sentences usually suspended as in his case so that we put them under control because there's always a threat that they go, get sent to jail but you don't put them in jail they're only under parole well he <laughs> but he poor guy got poisoned and went to germany to survive got healed, I mean, uh, uh, got better. So he broke his parole by going to hospital in Germany. Quite 
quite hilarious. Um, so anyway, he comes back instantly. Uh, he comes back. It's it's a whole adventure. They take him to a different airport. There was a mass of people waiting for him here. They uh, send the plane different airports, separate him from his lawyer, arrest him in the airport, and put him in a in a thirty day uh, you know jail or something. And I think the court case is happening this week as we speak. And people expect that he will be jailed. People expect that he will, you know, that sentence because it was suspended because of parole. Now he broke his parole and then he's going to get the sentence. Two and a half years, three and a half years or so. It's an interesting thing. It's, a, it's interesting for so many reasons. Like why would the Russian state, <clears throat> the, the Russian regime go to such length for uh, someone who he doesn't have a... a, a he ran for the Moscow mayoral position, if I'm not mistaken, got some good percentage, but never threatens to win. Uh, maybe 25%, but never threatened to win. And he's trying to organize for the upcoming elections from September, which will be legislative elections, not presidential. And um, uh, he's trying to organize, but he doesn't have a p political party that uh, organization of any sort of weight. Um, he's just trying to organize all forces that don't like the regime to kind of not let the party of the regime united Russia to win. I'm going to talk, talk a little bit more about this in a, in a, in a second. But it's, it's interesting to, to see, to, to ask why is he considered so dangerous? Uh, because you go to such lengths to do such ridiculous things, uh, you know, like broken his parole and, you know, I mean, obvious things. You can, you know, poison with Novichok. I mean, aren't there subtler met methods to whatever? Well, you know, previous major opposition figure, Boris Nemtsov, he was also, he was shot in Moscow a few years ago. Sometimes I wonder about these, these methods. Um, not that other methods would be, you know, oh, they're, they are okay, but um, if you know the situation and the political system in, in Russia and the, the, all the levers of power, economic and political, on which the regime rests, I don't see any of these figures really being such a major threat. Maybe they're just eliminated before they become such a major threat. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. But... That's the context. What I wanted to point uh, to you, and this is going to be linked directly in the in the um, box um, uh, under the, the video, <coughs> so also on the on the blog. But this specifically, I'm going to link it here because you can you know switch between this podcast and that video if you want. And what I want to point <laughs> to you is, well, this Navalny guy, he is very very brave. First of all, coming back, that was a uh, that was a, a strong move. Uh, very public, very outspoken. He's on, he's on social media. He's on Instagram. I'm not, so I don't know. Um, but uh, he has a YouTube channel, which I'm going to link because there's that video. <laughs> the first thing he did after he got here and he got arrested, well, his team, is they released a video that got, I don't know, there are more than 100 million views in like a week and a half who knows uh, the number now, since I watched it, um, in which he reveals this outrageous palace that Putin seemingly has built for himself. Now, if the whole operation would have been, you know, poisoning because of this film, it's not like I would understand, because this is like in these conditions, what is the here to understand, you know, this violence, whatever, but it would make sense. We're trying to understand phenomena. It would make sense in a way. But uh, the, just the nerve to release that video, which I invite you to watch the whole thing. It's about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, but it's well worth it. It's, it's really gripping. And it's a really a hard hitting investigation into the seeming palace that, that um, Putin built for himself. So what I want to talk about here is about that video. It's about that video and what we learned from that video sort of um, points that I took from it, but again, we're trying to understand goings on, right? So what does, what do certain things tell us of how institutions work, how politics works, 
yeah, we're trying to take a step back and understand processes. Yeah, so that's that's my point when I, I want to talk about this this uh, video is what do we learn in the sense of okay, it has this toilet brush made of gold or whatever. I don't care. Uh, but what does it tell us about <coughs> institutions, political communication, and so on? So, um, well, just a brief of uh, a brief context for the whole thing for those of you who are not that familiar. Um, <coughs> um, a context for the for the Putin regime, and I'm I would be very 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 reluctant to to call it Putin regime or any sort of name regime. I would never, for example, call it a Biden regime or a, a Trump regime because that's not what it is. Um, because regimes, political systems have a set of institutions that are set up in a specific way. And it's not dependent on who, which person is the head of the executive of the of the legislature. However, in the case of the Russian Federation, as I'm going to explain in a second briefly, there is there is reason to talk about the Putin regime. So, in the 1990s, after the Soviet Union disbanded, Russia became one. Russia was one of the republics of the Soviet Union, became independent from the Soviet Union. It was not the same thing. <clears throat> and then for about 10 years, it had what we could call a, a sort of liberal democracy. Yeah, like all the things that we have in the West on paper. Yeah, but it didn't have many things. Uh, for example, rule of law. So for example, functioning system of laws to which everybody was equally um, subject, which ba is based on functioning courts and functioning institutions of power like police. You had the form of liberal democracy. But the content was a disaster because the content was a dog eat dog, wolf eat wolf world in which 90% of the Russian society, maybe 80%, 85, became tremendously poor and disenfranchised, and a very narrow niche of elites where you had an <coughs> interpenetration of government institutions, so government power. Mob, mob, yeah, organized crime. Uh, the institutions of power of the of the state working with organized crime. So you had violence, you had political power, and you had economic power all intertwined for the benefit of 10-15% who well devastated the Russian economy, <coughs> weakened all the institutions of the state, and sent basically the 75%. 80% of the population into serious poverty. So the 90s were a decade of chaos, injustice, poverty, suffering, um, blatant injustice and equality. For the benefit of some very powerful people, powerful in the very immediate sense of violence, powerful economically and powerful politically, and it all went together. <coughs> so it was a disaster. And Russia itself, uh, from a, you know, being part of one of the empires of the 20th century, the Soviet uh, Union, the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, uh, it became a minor state. So chaos, uh, civil war in Chechnya and so on, poverty, laughable institutions of the state, inflation, the, world, the, the rule of the, of jungle, of the jungle. Now, <coughs> one, two things that any political system, any state needs to deliver in order to remain, to exist, are, are and they can be expressed through one word in two understandings, are, both can be expressed through the word security. Security that can be physical <coughs> and uh, let's call it economic security. But it's security. So the two things, physical and economic security, we can all call them security. Now, if the state does not provide security for its society, the, that state will not have a future. Because people put up with many things, forget voting, elections, whatever, that's nice. And and people want that, whatever. But the mind the, 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 the bottom line thing that any state needs to provide is security. The ability to live without fear and threat, continuous threat. Yeah, this is why we have army, police, yeah, and uh, military police, and the ability to 
live in the sense of to continue to live and to provide for you and your loved ones, right? To have a job, have enough to eat, kind of, that's, that's the minimum. Now, when that is threatened, that's when people have nothing left to lose. Because up until then, they can be threatened with losing them, but that's when <coughs> there's no other outlet but to revolt, to, to, to take arms against the regime, because there's nothing they can take anymore. So that was the context, actually, by the end of the 90s. Chaos, where both of these were threatened for a large part of the population. With a very weak state and nobody to, to, to solve this, because Yeltsin, who was the, the, the head of the executive then, the president, uh, was weak in many ways, uh, and by the end physically and mentally weak, so he was not the person to, to solve this. So he handed over the power, and the, well, he actually handed over the power on a, in a, on a temporary basis, and then there was elections where there were actually <coughs> elected him to this Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin came in, and in a relatively short time, he managed to wield power, because understand, if the state doesn't wield power, then others will. If the state doesn't create, it can wield it well, or it can, according to <coughs> laws and rights, or it can wield it abusively, but it needs to wield power. Because if the state doesn't wield power, other actors, warlords, mafia bosses, organized crime, <coughs> interest groups will wield power within the society. There's no such thing as a power a void, not for long. So the only one entity who can make order in a society is the state like it or not. Now Putin came in and was able to take control of the state and to make it effective enough to put order in society, and not just that, to strengthen again the Russian state which was deeply weakened in the 90s, and also to sort of domesticize uh, the oligarchs, yeah, all these well, economic organized crime, political power bosses, <clears throat> which had dominated Russia in the 90s. Most of them were taught to play along. Some refused and left the country. Some refused and met a different end. But he came and made order. And remember, from chaos, you know, if you go back to, to, to Plato, you will, you know, uh, what follows after democracy and stood in his understanding democracy is the rule of the mob and mob rule is chaotic. <clears throat> so what comes after chaos is dictatorship. Because when there's chaos, people want a strong guy to make order. I'm not saying this is what happened in, the, in Russia, because what you had is a transition from liberal democracy in the 90s, again, which didn't actually work, but it had all the appearances of liberal democracy, to uh, a sort of liberal democracy, and then I would call it, we, more, we could call it illiberal democracy, which is basically it has some liberal democracy traits, but some things that are not democratic, to an authoritarian regime. An authoritarian regime is a regime where politics is controlled, but other aspects of life are not, to basically a dictatorship. And I think we are at the point where we can call it a dictatorship, by which I mean that that <coughs> um, is ruled by one man, I would, you know, you know, these concepts and terms, they're not, when they try to describe reality, they're not going to encompass reality perfectly, yeah? <clears throat> but um, they help us understand. So it's kind of a dictatorship in the sense that there's one person who has ultimate power in the system, really black and white ultimate power. However, it's also an authoritarian system, meaning that politics is mostly controlled, well, 75% controlled. <clears throat> and there's also some, the appearances of a, a liberal democracy. So it's also, you know, sort of like an illiberal democracy. So you see, I'm backpedaling. But it's definitely not a liberal democracy. But you, you saw this, this transition. And the reason why I explain this is to understand the context and to understand why I mentioned this as the Putin regime. Because call it what you want. And I'm not saying dictatorship is all in the sense of you just throw an egg at someone's face. Dictatorship. No, no. I'm trying to describe 
conceptualize something, to understand, which means to understand who takes decision, how, how is this political system built, on what. I think at this point now, we got to the dictatorship point, which doesn't mean that it, there aren't mechanisms of democratic mechanisms there and institutions, even if they don't work as they should. It's a hodgepodge, but I think we got to that point. It's also an authoritarian system where most of politics is controlled and no real competition is allowed in politics, although there are elections, but they're slanted. So it's also an illiberal democracy because, yeah, I went through this again uh, before. So this is why I call it a Putin versus Navalny, because I wouldn't call it Yeltsin versus whatever, unless it would be like Yeltsin <coughs> individually in conflict with someone, but I would call it a regime, yeah, because it's the regime. There was no Yeltsin regime, in a way. Yeah, it, there was a liberal democracy. Long story short, that's the context in which we um, are living right now. Putin, when he uh, was elected, he always gets elected as president. <coughs> he was elected for two terms. There was a two-term limit, 2008. He ran out of terms, so he did the switcheroo with his prime minister, uh, um, Dmitry Medvedev. And Medvedev ran for presidency and Putin became prime minister uh, through legal means, through elections, whatever. And then he came back because you have two um, successive terms was the limit. Meanwhile, constitution was changed to extend again the, the, the term of the president to six years. It used to be six years in the, in the 90s. Then they made it more democratic to four years in the 2000s. Then Putin changed it back to six years. And he ran again for the presidency one. So now we are in the second term of the Putin presidency, first, uh, second, well, which is actually the fourth term. So twice in the 2000s, then prime minister, and then twice in the 2010s. And, and recently, last su summer, there was a constitution change, changed several things. Interesting to look at that as well. But one of the things it changed is again, basically removed the, the barriers from Putin to continue to run for the presidency for two more terms. Uh, and if he would win, so he would end this term, so 2012, 2018, 2018, 2024, and then he could run two more times for six years, so 2036. Well, he might run, I don't know if he will live that long, but <coughs> that's what's been happening. And so there's this context. But what you need, what we need what you need to understand and what we need to keep into consideration is that the fact that putin put order into the uh, russian uh, society and 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 solved the tragedy of the 90s cuz he did and in the 2000s you had significant growth and people got richer and the middle class grew and the state became again uh, proud and then invaded Crimea and had wars with Georgia because it could do it and again a proud member of the international uh, community as the state <coughs> he rebuilt the state he rebuilt the economy to a degree he increased the, the wealth and the, the welfare of the people he got re-elected you know because people appreciated that from chaos to stability and growth and patriotism and nationalism and whatever you want. 2010s, however, have been a period of stagnation, even decay, so that's a problem. Uh, COVID didn't help. Uh, sanctions because of Crimea don't help. Um, and, and there are other factors. But what I want to say is that Putin was a, a tremendous, uh, had a um, very, uh, was very successful in taking over um, a disaster and making it work, making the state work, making the institutions work. But for that, he needed certain means. And that means, as we will see, was a network of power that he was able to coalesce around himself and which was centered in him. He was the guarantee of that network. So from the beginning, I always said, even from the 2000s, that this is, you know, this system would not work without Putin. Because even if he has this network that makes this system work, if we remove him from this, it would crumble. So perhaps even earlier we could refer to a sort of a Putin regime. But what I'm saying is that we need to understand that context. That he made things work, and in order to make things work, he needed to create such a network of power. Okay, so this is the context within which this uh, documentary about the palace, which I'm not going to explain or tell you, because you can watch it, I, I'm going to be linked. 
<coughs> in the box there, a description box. But let's see what we learn from this from, from this video points that I want to make based on it. So first of all, <laughs> what immediately will hit you when you watch the documentary is that investigative piece, maybe, is that it is very funny. It is hilarious. Navani is a, is he has um, uh, he's a courageous guy. He's a courageous guy, but also has this biting irony, uh, sarcasm, not the same thing as irony, sarcasm that is makes it really, really funny and also very cheeky in the sense of, because he's, he's, he's referring directly to Putin and he's attacking him straight up. It's really something in the conditions in which most of the media in Russia is state controlled and regime controlled. So, wow. <coughs> then the description of the palace itself, actually, I'm going to give you a link in the blog to the Google Maps, you can see it on Google Maps. But I think the picture is from 10 years ago. But if you see the video, you see it. So you can see the Google Maps. So um, this palace, the description is, is, is staggering. <coughs> the size of the, t uh, not just palace, but he has some, according to the allegations in the documentary, Putin has the vineyards, the whole terrain, uh, palace. So there's this, this whole sort of principality that he built for himself, and I'm not using this word for nothing, because that's what the point that Navalny makes is that this is a this is a space where there's it's a no-fly zone. It's a no-fly zone. Who has a no-fly zone above their house? Yeah, because the argument would be, oh, it's not Putin's, it's some rich guys. No, no rich guy has a no-fly zone <laughs> above his. Is the terrain is leased from the FSB, which is basically the modern secret you know, service, police, um, uh, espionage agency of the Soviet uh, Federation, KGB. Yeah? So F the terrain belongs to FSB. There's no rich guy who gets their terrain from FSB. There's a no shipping area around, like a mile around the, the coastline, because this is on the coast of the Black Sea. Uh, <clears throat> so there's, you have to go around. You can go anywhere outside. So who has these things? It's ridiculous. But this whole terrain, everything, yeah, all this property has this principality. And why this term is good is because it involves a, a notion of um, sovereignty, of exclusive power, of nobody can trespass, of only one has power there. It's kind of like that. Because it looks like something, you know, it's fortified, it's this and that and that. Um, guards. <clears throat> it looks like a mini principality. Anywho, mini sovereign. And he compares it, uh, Navalny, in the documentary with uh, the Principality of Monaco, right, where you have Monte Carlo. Well, the size of the, that's called Putin Principality, is 39 times the size of the Principality of Monaco. The palace is gigantic, but uh, the co it cost, uh, there's so many hilarious points in this documentary, if you know how to look. Um, it cost, um, how much uh, I think it was <sighs> well in total all the money spent was about is about 1.5 billion dollars billion dollars to build this palace you know? but what's funny is that this palace is currently under reconstruction and it's been built once why are they rebuilding it because you know things are done the way things are done, you might have money, but you don't have good workers. Things are done shoddily. There were, you know, the rain was coming in. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. So you have all this luxury, but it's a hodgepodge. It's done badly. So you you poured about one billion dollar to actually have the you know rain seep into the walls. Ah, just too good. Uh, and then you know, four hundred fifty million dollars have been spent only on reconstruction. That's a huge amount of money. And this is the point that, and it is, again, for us, it's funny, enjoyable. We always want to do, look at things that are funny. Uh, but let's see what this, this means, yeah, what, what we can understand from this. Um, first of all, how, where do you get this money from? Because Putin doesn't have the image of a rich man. Yeah, he does not, you know, project that, does not behave that way, more like an ascetic servant of the state. The argument that Navalny makes, and here's the point, that, that this documentary is a documentary, but it's also sort of a political message, uh, messaging tool, yeah? And we need to look at it as that. Um, because 
I mentioned in the 90s, yeah, Russia was a, a failed democracy, which actually devolved into chaos, but had the appearances of liberal democracy. So democracy in the psyche of the regular Russian citizen is a bad word for all the good reasons, because the nice liberal democracy when everything was there was a, an acute disaster that caused a personal catastrophe of, of millions, okay? Democracy equals chaos equals injustice. So democracy, nobody wants that kind of democracy. We want to live, yeah? So the entire, if you look at the, 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 the narrative and the, the, the rhetoric used by Navani in the documentary, you'll notice that he does not use the term democracy. He, the two major attack points, if you look at the themes or ideas, not the details, are rich versus poor and corruption. And in fact, he makes the point that Putin appears rich, uh, poor, but he's the richest man in the world, he says. And Putin uh, makes this appearance of the servant of the state and whatever, but he's the most corrupt person in Russia. And corruption and rich versus poor were the big ills yeah, of the 90s. And if you look at the documentary, you'll notice that the entire argument is built on a description of the 90s or of Putin in the 90s, which makes the point that this entire um, uh, <coughs> scaffolding of power on which the Putin regime rests was actually built and belongs rightly into the 90s. So Putin, who has been the one who has fixed the 90s, and he has, that's me saying, is at the same time not just a product, but an embodiment of the 90s. I mean, you could not hit more deeply and more acutely at the entire sort of pillar, cultural political pillar of the current regime, which is, hey, do you want to go back to the 90s? If you don't want to go back to the 90s, then I'm the solution, says Putin. And he was, but not in, you know, as I said, lately it has been shaky. So the argument hits right there and puts him us together with all the other oligarchs from the 90s. That's, wow, that's some courage, that's some cheekiness there to do that. And that's a hard hitting thing. No, no, no uh, wonder that people react. And, and when he ends the documentary, because you know, what is the messaging? When he ends the documentary, as you see, we'll talk about this, he calls to, for action. But again, he's not gonna call for action in the sense of let's create democracy, because yeah, let's create the 90s again, no. He's going to make an argument, let's create a country that is like the rich countries. And he refers, by saying rich countries, he refers to democratic countries of the West, who are also prosperous. But he refers to them as the rich countries. He even says, the characteristics of the rich countries is that the people are politically active, of poor countries that they're not, or something like that. No, no. What he's saying is, accountability is a part of liberal democracy, functioning democracy, versus non-accountability, blah, blah, blah. But he can't use those words. So it's interesting to see how these, these, um, this argument is couched. <clears throat> um, and and, and how, what, is the, what, is the, what are the proofs that he brings to show that Putin is the richest versus you poor people and uh, the most corrupt <clears throat> versus the image that he projects as the enemy of you know, widespread oligarchic corruption? Well, he breaks down <clears throat> As I said, the, the network of connections built in the 90s by Putin, mostly in St. Petersburg, where he was working at the mayor's office, um, which he took with him to, to Moscow, and which is a combination of uh, former KGB, remember, uh, famously, Putin was a KGB agent, former KGB colleagues and, and agents, and childhood friends and family. Uh, and by the way, this is not nothing new if you know the Russian, you know, politics and how it works, because the so-called Siloviki or Siloviki um, were, uh, is a name for these structures of power, let me put it this way. So Putin, in the 2000s, he would appoint to different, uh, the heads of different institutions of the state and of the political system, uh, people who used to be in the KGB and was from his network of power. Well, why? Remember what I told you, <clears throat> that in order to take charge of this state, which was there in the 90s, but didn't work, because Yeltsin didn't have a network to, right, you have all these institutions. You need people who depend on you to put them into these institutions and make this state work as it should or as you want or whatever. 
he needed that to, uh, such a network to make the state work even to, for it to work well if you want to you could not build a liberal democracy without having the tools to make these institutions do their job you can tell them to do their job if they don't want to they're not gonna but if you have your man there he can make them and on and on and on so you see this is the the, the duality with which i want you to leave uh, my, which is my argument here at the end of this discussion on, on russia um, the duality of the thing on the one hand the corruption or whatever and the other hand the sort of the necessities of immediate politics two things that don't annul each other because just the fact that you say oh i need this network to make things work doesn't mean that you need to be a corrupt gangster yeah and but i'm just trying you know we're trying to understand that politics reality is always more complicated not darker or shady but more complicated complex yeah than just one thing anyway so um so he makes the point of in the documentary that putin built his network based on the on the 90s um and also um that uh and here's the the biting part right because we asked where does putin have this 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 kind of money from 1.5 billion just on this thing on this palace and, and the surrounding things that is some that is beyond ridiculous how and obviously he doesn't have them you know visibly i point you to uh, an hour and 35 into the movie one hour 35 that's timestamp where you have a graphic of the whole network of former kgb friends now at the head of state institutions or of companies of state companies businesses like oil gas <clears throat> and childhood friends and family members and mistresses and how they pump money year monthly yeah to these entities that on paper own the palace and own the vineyard and because they're all like non-profits or a business company or this and that and like why would what was it um rosnefta maybe one of the big state companies with with the natural resources uh, or maybe even the fsb why do they pump like million um, dollars a month into this you know company and usually it's covered with this hilarious you know rental agreement renting what for one million dollars so like they're paying monthly rent well that's huge rent even in i don't know san francisco or you know dc um so so you but that graphic that 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 uh, description of this network is so powerful and it hits again so hard because what it reveals is to the public to those who watch it yeah the regular russian citizen it reveals something very abominable because it looks again like one of those oligarchs from the 90s and in addition navani as i said very cheeky very courageous and very blunt and sarcastic he calls putin names well not he is not cursing him out but he's calling him you know a madman uh obsessed with money mentally ill which i mean you know, i don't like those things but um it's just shocking given this the the, the context of power in russia that he he does that but more importantly he creates a portrait of someone who is very petty who was always chasing money all his life and 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 real estate and square mile square footage put him and his family his, his wife which is again a very tough hit because it takes you know you hit through the aura of the powerful guy you know the thing the dress down resting bears swimming through icy cold siberian rivers on horseback um and then you depict him as a petty guy who wants one more square footage here and whatever and then it gets to the <coughs> opulence ridiculous hilarious opulence really hilarious opulence of the palace which is you know as with all again i'm the allegations is that these belong to putin i think they're pretty persuasive i'm not saying that you know i know something i'm just saying according to the documentary and it's pretty persuasive but so in this palace 
you um, you know a characteristic of, of um, dictators and I'm not saying Putin is a dictator even if I said dictatorship as a system because I explained it's because of how decisions are made but we talk, we talk about dictators it's usually like a, 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 a dismissive term you know like Ceausescu or Marcos in the Philippines or <coughs> Pinochet like these this mad crazy guys who you know whatever but truth be said when you look at each of those those dictators those those you know lunatics you notice that each of them were also uh, a megalomaniac who wanted this, who built this ridiculous, the expensive and yet hilariously in bad taste buildings. Ceausescu built so-called the Palace of the People, which was his palace in many ways, that is as big as the Pentagon, second biggest building in the world. Some some nonsense. So you have you know you have in Africa some dictator building a replica of the St. Peter's Basilica of Rome. Yeah. Um, so, anywho. But the point is, without saying that, you know, whatever, uh, throwing words around, you look at this palace and there's some bad taste. It's it's like a palace of a nouveau riche, you know, like a, one of these um, up-and-coming new rich guy, you know, who from nothing to... So who doesn't have the culture behind the money, so he just has money, so he doesn't know how to spend it, and basically, oh, well, I went to Versailles, I saw these Baroque things, or whatever they were, I want such, and that's kind of how it looks. It looks like a 17th, 18th century, uh, you know, Versailles, but also with, you know, flat TVs, and uh, famously by now, an aqua discotheque, an aqua disco. Look at the video, you see what that is. Um, there's a hookah bar. There are all these weird rooms throughout the palace for very particular... Uh, uh, there's a theater, an actual theater, which is nice. I, I, I wouldn't mind that. But there's also a hookah bar um, with a small stage where there's also a pole for dancing. And um, there's a smaller room uh, where there's, uh, there's a whole room where there's uh, uh, model trains or machines, like, you know, you all had that Gobo, Gobos, I think. Uh, not that I'm comparing, but, you know, some ridiculous stuff. So anyway, you have this combination. And, you know, Navalny mentions, uh, not even in the palace, some, some other building, there's this, um, he has the, you know, he has some great sources. He has some people who who worked on the palace, people who were directly involved, people, so he, he documents, he has access to documents, so this is it's a persuasive document, uh, documentary film, without saying that, okay, this is what it is, because I can't say that, but I say that while you're watching the documentary, I think that it makes a persuasive case for the factual part, then there's the political rhetoric. Um, but, be it as it may. But there's this um, uh, toilet brush, and toilet brush holder bought for that bathroom restroom in uh, some other building a small building which which each of them cost like um oh uh, hundreds of dollars thousands of dollars maybe no thousands of dollars yeah fifteen hundred dollars or ten thousand dollars a toilet brush or some some ridiculous you know because all everything all the furniture is bought from these more most luxurious um, top-notch, top-end, high-end uh, Italian furniture makers, you know, all handcrafted, including toilet. But the point he makes, and this is, this is my point, besides the hilarity of it all, is that the toilet brush and that cost this much, this much, it's in a, just in a building, not even in a main palace, says Navani. And here's how much it costs, here's the numbers, which is more than the pension of a regular pensioner in Russia. And this is where the hit comes. That's the point here. That is a, this is what I'm trying to emphasize here. Besides having fun, uh, is 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 what is the what are the political arguments? What is the political rhetoric used here? Um, well, anyway, as I said, uh, I am um, warmly encouraging you to to watch this this um, uh, this documentary. There's there's much more uh, to be to be said about it. Um, but let's let's close that discussion um, and just uh, briefly uh, think about what will happen next. Now, of course, I don't know. I, I am uh, both reluctant and uh, I don't. It's not my job to to make predictions. Nor do I like to do it. Nor do I do it. Um, 
but um, it is worth asking what will happen right now. Not because of the documentary, but although I think that that will have its um, aftermath somehow. Um, it's worth asking what will happen now that Navalny is in prison. Um, the documentary was a smash, but I'm not saying this is going to change whatever. People came out last Sundays, last weekends, in, in significant numbers, not necessarily in sheer numbers, but in the breadth and uh, of the of the uprising, sort of well, protest. All protests were banned, yeah, <clears throat> there was also COVID. But they came out in about 100 cities across the Russia, which is a huge thing. Point being is that Navalny has managed to unite the opposition, opposition that is very, 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 very different, of very different colors. One of the articles I'm, uh, I'm going to link in the blog is uh, gives you a survey of the various, from, from communists to nationalists to monarchists. They all hate Putin, but for very different reasons. They don't even like Navalny necessarily, but he managed to unite them behind, and that's a huge thing. So this is why I'm wondering, wow, I mean, the moves that the regime did, this, this, these sort of clumsy and brutal moves, I'm not sure are the best because it just makes him into even a bigger hero. And he managed to unite them, so you had these widespread uh, protests, <coughs> good numbers as well, but also in terms of the, because usually they had these protests would happen in Moscow, St. Petersburg, some big cities, but you know, you had them in the Far East. Russia is 11 time zones, yeah, Far East. So people are mobilized by Navalny. He has this power, he has this power also because, and, and his profile only grew by surviving Novichok, coming back. That's courage. People respect that. Crazy courage. And, and now this documentary will also, I'm sure, have its own uh, over aftermath. What is Navalny trying to achieve with this documentary? And in general, uh, immediately, um, as I said, to mobilize the opposition, not to create one party, which would be impossible, but to, he is at the end of the, right, because he creates an argument, he makes points, and then he ends by, you know, he needs to tell you, okay, based on this, let's do this. And he makes the point with accountability, blah, blah, blah. but there are some specific things he wants. He wants the main thing he makes, the main point he makes is that we are the majority, sort of the silent majority that you know, Nixon talked about, but in a different context. Uh, that these corrupt people, all this network, there are about a few hundred thousand people maybe, but we are tens of millions. That's a strong point. Two, um, that's a strong point to which more people will resonate because he was, he, he is now the, undoubtedly, the, the central figure of opposition who is also trusted. That's what makes him central, not because he's the leader, but he's trust, tr tr you know, he, he can be trusted by people from, people who don't like him. Um, and the other thing he made as a specific point was, um, to organize for the elections in September for the Duma, uh, which is the lower house of the of the legislature in the Russian Federation, so that the uh, more united Russia candidates would be unseated. The United Russia is the party that supports Putin. Putin is not a member of the party, but is uh, I, I call it the part a party of power. United Russia, as the name indicates, it doesn't have a clear ideology. Its ideology is to is to support the regime, and that's the purpose of it. And it's been winning elections, but even now in the polls, it's not doing good. In different regions, regional elections, is not doing good. That good. Probably still going to win. And the reason, the, the way in which, uh, and I'm going to conclude with this, um, Navalny wants uh, to um, uh, fight the United Russia and to unite the opposition again, not as actually uniting them because they're very different, is uh, by coordinating voting. And he has a, a, a page that I'm going to link uh, and an app <laughs> that he is um, suggesting, uh, promoting, um, SmartVote. And it's basically 
in each district to vote for no matter which candidate only the uh, but for the candidate who is not united russia and has the highest chance to win and whether they're communist or they're uh, monarchists or they're liberal or they're whatever they are as long as it's not united russia and it's not united russia and has a chance the guy with the girl with the highest chance and not united russia folks just vote for that even if you don't like him or her that's the so there's some concrete plans here but what will happen in the in immediate future well now we're gonna have to wait for the court decision on, on uh, navalny okay so in, enough about um so navalny versus putin russia as I said, you, uh, there will be sources and resources, references in uh, the blog. The video, though, for the documentary is going to be linked straight in the um, description box. So let's uh, end, as I promised, with um, a discussion of um, brief, brief discussion of a movie. As I said, I would like to end every episode with discussing, you know, maybe a book. Uh, maybe a, a movie that, um, or a documentary, or something that talks about politics, and I make I want to make here the the, the, the difference, the distinction between um, a political movie and a movie about politics, or a, a political book and a book about uh, politics. <coughs> I don't like political movies. I don't like political books. I do not. Uh, I think they are uh, the opposite of what art should do. Art and politics are should. Uh, um, they should have their own sovereign spheres. That is my uh, position on that. But art has a specific movies, books, songs, have a specific uh, power that, uh, you know, political science doesn't have. And this is why when I teach politics, I always ask students to watch or read books or watch movies on their own, because they flash out the dry reality we talk about in class. We examine institutions, but if you if a movie is good, if a book is good, they're gonna show you the lived experience of politics. Yeah, so that's why I call movies about politics, films about politics. So this is Carlos. This is Carlos is a mini series or TV series done by a French director um, in 2010. It came out in 2010, uh, <clears throat> and uh, which doesn't matter. Um, and what I want to point out here and to recommend is that you watch the. Uh, there are different versions of this. There is a version as a one movie, more or less, and there's a version as a TV series. And I want, uh, I would suggest that you watch the TV series or the mini series, and you will differentiate them. Um, they all have episodes, but you will differentiate them because the TV series has, is five and a half hours long in total, so about six hours long, about two hours each episode. Three episodes are about two hours, six hours long, five hours forty-five. That's the one you should watch. There's also a two hour and 30 minute something movie or shorter episodes, skip. Because the most interesting part is, 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 is when, you know, unlike in the short version, in the long version where they, which is the actual version, they just cut it for a shorter version, <clears throat> is to understand the background of, of, of the actions, of what, what those events, um, that made Carlos famous, while in in the short one you only get the events more or less. Uh, so get the TV series. Uh, actually, you can watch it on the Criterion channel, uh, which is a streaming service. Uh, I'm not saying you should subscribe. You actually have a two-week trial period. Uh, I'm going to link it uh, in the blog. Um, there is a two-week free trial, so do that if you want. You can subscribe as well. So. Um, well, besides the fact that production value is fantastic, filmed in all the, you know, from Budapest to the Middle East to France to, I mean, uh, London to name it, um, production value, cars, haircuts, dresses, like it's, it's mostly about the 70s, like right? Carlos was in his heyday in the 70s and 80s. Uh, production value is fantastic. Also, the main actor, um, um, is is remarkable. I, I you know hats off to him, uh, Edgar Ramirez. Uh, fantastic job, really really fantastic job. Also uh, notable, he is fluently multilingual in the movie, which is he even speaks some words of Hungarian. Wow, uh, so fantastic job. Um, but again, 
you watch it as, as, as with other things we what I want to point out are some you know points from the you know sort of political analysis or, or trying to understand yeah uh, with the tools of, of, of political science so to speak a little bit of what it shows and I'm just gonna point out a few things that kind of stood out for me it's a very enjoyable very enjoyable um, um, uh, series First of all, um, it depicts very powerfully how the, the, the terrorist groups, and the Senatis was a heyday of terrorist groups, people forget this, we have very short memory, heyday of, uh, but how they were intertwined and, and, and how they worked literally, well, worked together, worked together literally in the same room, in that sense, worked together, like the same group, different groups organized, uh, um, Recruited each other's members because they needed people to get things done for so they gave, it's like you know It's like in many ways it's like organized crime. It's like oh, they did us this service. We need to help them, you know Beat that guy up <clears throat> kind of like that so and you had you know uh, the the communist uh, extremist groups in West Germany you had the pro-Palestine terrorist groups you had Carlos with his own gang you had ETA from 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 Spain which is the Basque separatist movement so you have this platter of very different things because the point with Carlos is that he was a Marxist at least on paper um, uh, so he he had an ideology but then he kind of switched into uh, imperialism versus oppressed people and then uh, then even kind of pledged allegiance to the Irani Islamic Republic as you will see one of the things that comes uh, about in this um, from this documentary from this well, in many ways a documentary it's this TV series because it was well researched is how um, m these terrorist groups although moved by different, you know, ethics for independence of the Basque region in Spain, Palestinian, whatever, um, uh, how they, um, at various points and effectively were acting as mercenaries. But let's just stick with what I was saying. So the international nature of the terrorist movement was, was one thing, which also takes us to, when you see them traveling so easily between different countries uh, in the 70s, uh, now it's even easier with the European Union and so on and uh, in general in the world to travel you know it, it brought out and depicted very powerfully another aspect which is globalization and globalization is not good it's not bad it is a phenomenon uh, which is a, a, a has many aspects including the free circulation of goods and information yeah this is why we have the internet that's part of globalization if you don't like it call it off um, this is why uh, we have um, uh, but this is the, the globalization let's say it's good or whatever but the, the fact that there's a free circulation of goods ideas products uh, per people you can travel tourism well there's also bad things that circulate so globalization the globalization of good things yeah let's say they're good also comes inevitably with the globalization of bad things because free travel is free travel so the same what well, it's one might be a tourist the other guy can be a terrorist yeah they start with t both of them but they're not the same um so so that's an that's another it's very poignant how it shows the the the, the globalization of um, uh of, of evil right and we know that from narco trafficking from human trafficking it's it's all around us and and you know we have all this like or the internet it has the dark side it has the light side you know you can there's you know good things can be done on it or bad things and it's the same tool so that's another interesting thing but um back to i uh, to the terrorist groups i mentioned that in many points they were actually acting as mercenaries well carlos at the end becomes more more of a mercenary than anything else and the reason why they were mercenaries whose mercenaries were they well these terrorist groups were, and Carlos made his name by daring to do certain things, yeah? Because what are terrorist groups? By definition, uh, are groups that uh, use terror as a political mean, meaning that they use violence for political ends. Uh, and the logic is that when you, uh, indiscriminate violence, yeah, indiscriminate violence uh, frightens, yeah, and hence the name terror, East, frightens a society and the political decision makers and forces them to change political course so the goal is always political it's policy 
yeah, with regular terrorists. We want them to do this politically. And in order to force them to do that, we can defeat them. We can force them directly, like because we're small and, and uh, in, you know, uh, they're big. It's a state or individual groups, whatever. So what we do is not take over the state. We can fight a war and win against the state. But we can do, and we can, you can't even weaken it. But what we can do is to create havoc and creating random havoc has a psychological effect on the population, which then puts pressure on the decision makers and forces them to do what we want. That's the logic of terrorism. That's, that's what makes a group a terrorist group. Random violence with political, uh, uh, um, which, which leads to a psychological effect, which leads to political um, action or effect or result. Um, but so Carlos and other, some other groups and his group, um, they were an asset because they dared to do these things. Because the things with terrorism and, and the movie is good at depicting how haphazard, incompetent and inane sometimes these things are mostly botched <coughs> attempts and whatever. We usually know the, the successful ones. But the successful ones, if you understand, it's not, you know, of course, I mean, first of all, it's nothing to be admired. It's, it's horrible. But it is also nothing to be admired in the sense that, okay, you are successful at, at setting fire to your own house. This is, a, this is a terms in which we need to think. Destruction is so easy to do. Yeah? Punch someone in the eye in the metro. Okay, great. Oh, fantastic. We were successful. It's not hard to do. Why don't you punch someone randomly on the metro? Because you're going to get arrested. So, so what these terrorist groups have is they, they dismiss the uh, aftermath, the, the repercussions, because the biggest deterrence of, of such random terrorist acts is consequences and repercussions. Of course, you can prevent them, but repercussions are the, you know, you, like, remember what happened in Afghanistan after, you know, the 9-11, yeah? Well, that was a lesson if it needed to be, and, you know, don't try to do it. It's like, um, uh, you know, many times heads of state, they're not safe because, you know, they can find holes in all kinds of walls, right? But what happens next, you don't want to know, yeah? If you commit something against the head of state, you will be found. There's nowhere to hide, something like that. So the, the reason why Carlos was an asset with his group was because they showed that they dared to do things. Even some of them, maybe most of the ones depicted were unsuccessful or botched or whatever, or partially successful, as you will see, which is a good peek behind the myth. Uh, but they were assets. But whose assets were they? Well, who needs such tools? First of all, there might be a terrorist group that has its own, and they, they said that they had their own, but you know they need tools. They need money to organize, and they need guns. Who gives them money and guns? Well, who has money and guns? Well, there can be a rich guy or whatever. States. And especially, and what the movie does fantastically well, is to depict how the states, the different states, Libya, Syria, Iran, at different points, Iraq, uh, use them hired them, paid them, sustained them. KGB, USSR, KGB was a, the Stasi, the secret police from East Germany, were close friends with the terrorists from left, extreme left terrorists from West Germany, were close buddies with the Stasi, that abominable institution. They funded, protected them, whatever, even if they kept them at arm's length. Yeah? So in many ways, and you see that many of these actions, but you're doing this for Iraq because they have a grudge against Saudi Arabia. How is this a tool, an act of revolution, Carlos, whose real name was actually uh, Ilich Ramirez Sanchez. His brother was called Lenin. His family were, you know, uh, devout Marxists. Um, and... Uh, uh, so, so Carlos, um, uh, you know, he's paid, as I said, and his group uh, by um, Iraq to take hostage the oil minister of Saudi Arabia 
All right, how is this helping the Marxist cause? Okay, the Ba'athist party in Iraq and Saddam were, were, were socialists, but still. So there's a lot of such gray area, like, and, and it's hilarious to it said to see these devout, especially the lower ranks, um, you know, followers of Carlos, for example, because he imposed sort of this military discipline in his group. Um, and they were expected to follow him blindly, which they did, because it's part of the fervor of the ideologue. But then he was doing things for this state against the other state. So it's it's fascinating to see this and to, you know, to show it as it is. Um, besides, you know, the pettiness and the smallness and the banal nature of the, of the very person at the end, especially in the 80s when there was a, you know, sort of, he was popular because of the image he projected and um, media created image. And this is why he was also sought after because they wanted to use this image to um, as a as a tool. As I said, these states they had various wars to fight with Western states, let's say Syria against France, but they would never fight it with regular means. So terrorist groups were used as a tool of statecraft, including Carlos. It was their little sort of tool, yeah. We don't have guerrilla, we don't have army, or well, we do, but we can't fight France with that. It's not going to happen. But we can fund terrorists to achieve. So, you see, ter terrorist groups as tools of statecraft, also very interesting, including for the KGB as well. But, um, so, um, so towards the end of the 80s, Carlos, decay, whatever, but especially <clears throat> then, but also throughout the movie, showing the sort of the, the persona of Carlos, the human person. By the way, he's in a prison in France uh, when he, he was arrested in 97. Um, showing the, it shows you as always, behind the myth, behind the curtain, behind the hula baloo, the petty, banal, and at the end of the day, boring and what's this all about, nature of these, all of these people. And it's very useful to see that. And to you should watch it to see it, but the the most apt comparison here of you know Carlos as a person and the series is for example with another series that is uh, has been going on on Netflix, Narcos. Carlos with Narcos. Um, because Carlos is no different from any of those organized crime narco traffickers. Not in behavior, you know, he likes a good life, he likes to drink champagne, he, when he has a 30 uh, year party, have a birthday party, it's, it could be taken from any Colombian narco traffickers party, it's the same, only that it's in Budapest and it's not in uh, Colombia. Could be in Colombia, since, you know, uh, Carlos was from uh, South America. But, um, so it's, it's the same thing, women, you know. Um, uh, you know, debauchery, this and that. Uh, so, what's different, right? So, so there's, there's. I think that the, the most powerful things that this 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 movie, this this series uh, reveals, shows us, uh, teaches us, whatever. As I said, one is sort of the international institutional uh, context and and relationships that that allowed for Carlos to exist and supported him because it helps you understand these networks of violence, um, globalized violent action. But the other part is the human part, which I think is also very revealing and, 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 uh, and relevant. Um, and it's also, you know, it's, a, it's an entertaining series, no doubt about it. Just like the Narcos, you know, these are, these are, because you have always, you have, a, you know, you have this hostage taking and then you have, you know, some, the preparations and the personal life and then again, some bombing and some, so there's action and whatever. Um, if you take it only as a, as a movie. I'm gonna, um, well, there, there's some things that I didn't like, but I think there's needless, um, you know how uh, nowadays every TV series needs to have some explicit, well, beyond explicit scenes, at least once in an episode, which not necessarily 
because you know you need to show that dimension but how you show it and why and what is the purpose here yeah well but that's an aesthetic judgment um, <clears throat> the point I want to end with is an ironic point that how does it end that why does Carlos get arrested how you know because he survived for about 30 years in the wilderness when he was protected because he would find refuge he would find refuge in the, uh, different countries of Eastern Europe or the Middle East depending who was, who was the sponsor or what was the network supporting him. You see, he was a pawn in many ways in, in their hands. And then when they told him no longer, because our politics, our state leadership told us, we, we don't want to get sanctioned by the West, you need to leave in two weeks, they need to leave. <coughs> it's quite ridiculous. And then how they're kicked out from Syria to Libya and none of them wants to... But what, why, at a certain point, nobody wants to support him anymore? Because, you know, you can always use a, uh, you know, um, such mercenaries, in a, in a way. Well, guess what? It was 1989. It was the, the, the anti-communist revolutions from Central Eastern Europe, uh, and the fall of the Soviet Union, but which ended, basically, the Cold War. And the Cold War uh, and and the existence of the of the sort of a communist bloc, which again was a political, was supported by by force, right? Not by the people. The people revolted against it. It's that that allowed Carlos to hide and to be financed and whatever. And and it was in that Cold War situation that the Middle Eastern countries could play one side against the other, yeah, and get get um, benefits. Some of these dictators, yeah, Syria, Libya, Gaddafi. Um, Sadat and so on uh, so the irony here is what is that it's popular people's uprising it's no, not the CIA not the French secret police not the whatever it's people uprising for freedom against the regime so basically the people Carlos supposedly fought for the little people, the oppressed against the imperialists <laughs> which is what happened in the revolutions of 89 it's the rise of the oppressed against the empire soviet union and, and its, its cronies that ends his career as a fighter for the oppressed not because he says oh they won because he was a Marxist communist he probably cried a little bit when the berlin wall fell or whatever the stasi supported him but uh who takes away from him any reason uh not not uh, um reason for action but takes the reason takes the support that allowed the other countries to sponsor him and suddenly libya syria tells him ah, now we need it's a whole different the war is over they say <laughs> meaning cold war we need to deal with the west we can't afford this anymore we can't afford you and libya and this and this and that and he ends up in Sudan and so on and you, you can watch it but it, I found it quite telling that this this um, felicitous event of the anti-communist revolutions of 1989 which were a genuine popular uprising uh, led to the end of the career and the decay of the famous fighter for the oppressed mercenary slash warlord slash you know uh, Carlos the jackal okay so this was it this was uh, our first episode of the of the podcast i hope you enjoyed it you can watch it in smaller chunks or whatever and as i said um we hopefully we shall uh, according to plans we shall see each other in uh, two weeks from now on a monday thank you